when you first open a law firm, not only do you need to learn business, but then you realize you're the HR department and the runner and the receptionist and a thousand other jobs in addition to being a lawyer. And it's in those moments that we truly have to figure out what's the best use of our time and what do we need to learn to take the next step. For a lot of attorneys, especially the successful ones, it's that transition from being a lawyer to turning into a business owner of really starting to delegate and pass things on. That's why I'm really honored to have Russ Barbiars here with us. He's an estate planning and probate attorney. He's going to talk to us about his journey. So we'll hear that story and we'll also get some takeaways for any other lawyers listening to this that are really struggling to change hats from that lawyer hat to truly running a great business. Russ, what else can we fill in about your bio before we talk about our last episode? Sure. So as as Jordan mentioned, um, I am a primarily an estate planning uh, and probate attorney. I I also, uh, in addition to running my law firm, I also own a real estate title company. Uh, so we do uh, a bit of uh, real estate work uh, as well as um, as insuring title. Um, so between the two, it keep, keeps us pretty keeps me pretty busy. Um, I've got uh, three children, the old, oldest of which is ten, so that also keeps me busy. Uh, so you know that's sort of it. There we go. Love it. Yeah. All right, so we're going to dive deeper into Russ's journey starting the firms. Uh, starting the two companies, operating it, running it, all those things. Before I get into that, though, I want to talk about our last episode briefly. That episode, we listened to Dave Zampano. Dave talked to us about the digitization of the practice of law, how technology is transforming the way lawyers will practice. So not just having a brick and mortar office, not just going virtual, but truly taking that next step towards digitization, what that means and what that looks like for the future of our firms. Uh, Dave especially talked about it from an estate planning practice, so the ability of a lot of your clients to truly enter all the information and not need you until they need you. So great episode if you are struggling with those things. But enough about that. Russ, I want to hear, when's the moment when you knew that you wanted to be a lawyer? I think that I always thought I was going to be a lawyer. There was, there was, it, it was really, there was a brief moment in college when I thought, nah, I'm not going to be a lawyer. And, but I, I, I was a politics and history major. So really I was qualified to, to do one, one of three things, teach, become a lawyer, starve. So I, I chose, I chose the second option, whether it was a good option, I don't know, but it was the option I picked. Dude, I didn't know that. I was a history major also. So my yeah. running joke was if law school didn't work out, I was going to go beg to be a Mythbuster. That was my backup plan. That it's It still could be possible. I mean, you are on the road trip. So you, there could we find, go. you could find a whole bunch of myths to bust while you're out there. Very true. Um. So, all right. So you've got the degree. Law school becomes a thing. Um, did you know what kind of law you wanted to practice before you went into law school or how did you come across that? So when, before, I w- I w- before I went to law school, I actually took some time. I took about a year off between or about a year and a half between graduating um, from college and going to law school. And part of that time, I worked for a public health nonprofit um, in Boston. And so as I, you know, transition from from that role into a role into going into law school i really thought that what i what i really wanted to do was work with doctors and hospitals and do health healthcare law um and and whatnot and um i can tell you i do none of that <laughs> uh i i do have one one client who's a chiropractor right now and it's sort of it, it, it's it it's fun in a way um, because it's some of what I wanted to do, but it also, I also know that I don't know enough to do it any to do the, the, like highly technical stuff. Um, but you know, I did, you, you know, and sometimes I find you, you, stuff happens in life. And so in law school, I met my wife and her, her father, uh, owned, owned a, a firm, uh, here in Pennsylvania. And so uh, essentially, uh, after we got after we got married, I sort that sort of I you know started working with my father in law, and that sort of you know has given me a base and sort of sort of driven where I've gone. Now, was the father in law's firm doing the same stuff that you're doing today, or did you change the practice areas? So, uh, when 
when I joined the firm, he, he did primarily estate planning and estate administration or probate. I did, you know, I started doing some other stuff. Like I started doing um, some family law and uh, whatnot. So I definitely broadened the areas that we were, that we were, that we were doing. Um, and now I'm sort of contracting back because I, I particularly over the last two years have seen the, the value of specialization. Uh, you know, our practice is in a, is in a small town. So it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to, to stay, to say no to a lot of, a lot of business. However, uh, I think that uh, you can't be an expert at everything. And so I found that I particularly enjoy the estate planning and the estate administration. And that is, is, and always has been a large part of our business. So we've sort of honed it on, on some of that. Makes perfect sense. So walk me through a little bit of that journey from the, you know, coming on board, expanding the practices, and then we'll talk more about, you know, how you decided what to contract to. Sure. So, so I did, I started my career, uh, my legal, legal career first I, I did work for uh for a judge uh in vermont or a group of judges as a law clerk uh and then when i came to pennsylvania i did i did work for the district attorney um for uh for a year so i i had sort of some different experiences um and then uh when i started working um with my father-in-law i mean i knew nothing uh, i i could you could i could go to a preliminary hearing you know and i and i could you know, run through run through that. You know, I think I, I I did one jury trial while I was in the in the DA's office, but I knew really nothing about you know what it meant to be a lawyer in private practice. I knew nothing about what it meant to run a business. So there were there was a lot of learning that had to happen, uh, and it really you know the first say five years or so really was just learning how to be a lawyer um and you know you know and just trying to trying to figure out what that what that what that meant um hold on one second sorry yeah the uh my wife is waving at me through the window and uh needs to come in so i just gave her the heads up so anyway yeah. all right so you started, you know, nothing. And I think that's kind of the common lawyer refrain, right? Like we, law school doesn't really teach you to be a lawyer. It teaches you maybe to think critically. Yeah. And I, I'll, I, I always remember the, the, the first time that I had to, to do anything, you know, I had to do a deed, which, you know, now is second nature. But I just remember, you know, having to be told, well, these are all the different parts of the deed, you know, and, and sort of walking through that, it's just, you don't know what you don't know, and I and I and I think the the more I learn, the more the more I. It's almost like the more terrifying it became, because when I first started, I wasn't I wasn't scared about anything because I didn't know that I didn't know anything. <laughs> uh, but you know, I certainly found you know, particularly over the last you know two or three years, that law firms need, law firms need to run run like businesses. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of, a lot of lawyers, you know, fall back on the, on the concept that, well, we're a profession. Uh, and so because we're a profession, uh, you know, we're insulated from the normal pressures of a business, but at the end of the day, that's just not true. Uh, and, and I think that it, it, it got, it really got highlighted, um, I think in COVID, uh, but, but I think that it certainly has been, it's been a goal of mine for, for longer than that. So go into more detail with me on that. Cause obviously I a thousand percent agree with you both yeah. from the standpoint of like, we need to do it and we don't do it enough. I always find the like, well, it's a law firm or oh, well, we're professionals or whatever, but ultimately at the end of the day, good business is good business. So how mm -hmm. did you begin down this path of learning about the ownership or what were the most important things you learned at the beginning, you know, anything along those lines? So, I don't know when I, I mean, I always thought of, of the practice as a business that needed to be run like a business. I don't think I knew exactly what that, what that really meant, but I always recognized the fact that, 
it needed to be run like a business. And, and and there are things, you know, I think it sort of came, you know, some of the things came slowly, like at some point, and I, I can't even remember how long ago this was now, you know, I started doing a, an annual budget for the business. Like, so, you know, trying to be intentional and trying to, you know, not be like, Oh, well, where'd all the money go? You know, trying to, to have some planning. Um, I hired an accountant who did tax planning uh, specifically because he did tax planning. Um, also turns out that he's also an attorney, so he understands the business pretty well. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, I started looking, you started looking at, you know, how am I going to attract clients? And even, and it was, it was before COVID, I started looking at things like, like lawyerist, uh, and in some of the materials that they had at that point, they were running an insiders program that you had to like pay like a hundred dollars a year or something. Um, and so I got some material materials. I signed up for a course with them. Um, it brings you back to the, uh, it might be expensive to learn knowledge, but it's way more expensive to not have that knowledge or it costs you it, a lot more to not have that it, knowledge. I think is the same. I, I, I think, and I think you're absolutely right because it's, it's one of the, it was one of those where, as I started to, to look at different the different ways to structure structure a business, um, you know, I realized that there are ways to le- to leverage you know my skills uh, as an attorney so that I can do more, but not have to do everything. And and that and that's I think been been a huge a huge lesson, and that's you know a con- you know a constant that's constant learning. <laughs> you know, trying to, trying to do that and do that effectively. So in terms of doing more, but not doing everything, I mean, are we talking about hiring more people, delegating more things, bringing in experts, outsourcing or combination of all those things? Yeah. Yes. Yes. To all, all of the above. Um, I have, I mean, at this, at this point, I mean, I have, I have hired, you know, quite a bit, quite a bit, a bit in terms of staff. I have some, some jobs that I would like to hire for in the future, uh, like already identified, (laughs) uh, you know, which is sort of interesting, like, because a lot of this, I think comes down to, to just being intentional, just, you know, trying, you know, trying to understand where you, where you want to be and then trying to put the steps in place to get there. And I think when you're, when you're trying to practice law and you don't, you're not thinking this way, you're just, you're just trying to swim and, and unfortunately, or maybe just oh, not drown. Well, that's where I was going. It sort of oh. feels like feels like you're Sorry. drowning all the time. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> because, <laughs> and and I quite honestly, I got tired of feeling like I was drowning, and and that's that's why that's really what has motivated me to try to move in the, in this direct in this direction to be more intentional, because I think when you're when you're practicing law and you're just thinking, well, I'm going to, I'm running a practice. It's I'm a professional. I don't need to have goals. I don't, you know, I don't need to, to really think about what I'm doing. I just need to do it. You can't help but drown because you can't, because, because then you're, you're just sort of trying to put out each leak or each fire as it happens. So when it comes to, I mean, I want to get, I I guess meta is not the right word, but like, what you have identified between that, you know, hire, delegate, outsource, uh, mm-hmm. bring in an expert, whatever it is, is so huge, especially as you take that transition into being a business owner. As a lawyer, it's easy. Well, it's easy. It's, easy. it's simpler to do everything, although it's harder. So can you walk me through a little bit of like your process in deciding either what goes to who or where you hire or what priority you put behind things? Sure. I mean. So when I'll go back like, you know, two years ago and I'll, you know, pre-COVID, I'll sort of, you know, explain, you know, my, my staff structure was myself and my wife were the, were the, were, were the two attorneys. Uh, and, and she worked, she worked probably about 50, 50% of the time. Um, she worked three days a week. Um, and, and then we also had, you know, we had, you know, say two paralegals uh, and two legal assistants. And, you know, as we went into COVID, we initially, you know, I mean, that was pretty much when she stopped working in the, in the firm. So part of this was necessity was, was, you know, having to 
trying to find a way to get get everything done. And and as we as we move as I move forward, I thought I was you know, I did you know I run an estate primarily an estate planning practice and probate practice, and so I have you know I developed a probate you know probate paralegal who you know that's all she does. I also in the process realized that it would be really helpful if I wasn't the person who had to keep track of all of the estate plans we were working on. And, and because it, it was sort of that drowning moment where I felt like, you know, things would, something would fall through the cracks because it was, it really was no one's job to track these things. So I, I, I hired a remote employee, or not an employee, she's a contractor through Upwork. Uh, and her job was to draft, actually do the drafting, you know, based on the instructions I gave her. But her job was also to keep track of where everyone was in the process and to follow up with the clients if we were looking for something or if we needed to schedule an appointment so that we could provide better customer service to the clients because they weren't the ones driving the process. We were driving the process and and things weren't falling through the cracks and it made things so damn efficient. <laughs> like you, I remember when she, when she started in this role and it was like it was just a chaotic mess and in about two or three weeks she had everything like humming along like a well-oiled machine and it just has continued (laughs) yet it's amazing to me how far just that uh, observation or over overseeing the cases you know managing the cases not just managing people ends up allowing you to get proactive and then that just opens so many doors well, right, right, and 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 it was just, and I, and I just I just find that now I'm not worrying about that. Like I'm not the one at eight o'clock at night, you know, going through you know my files. And like, oh, well, where where is this and where is this? What the, the the process that we put into place is that at the end of her at the end of her week, she sends out a spreadsheet to to myself, to my office manager, and to the other person the other uh, person on the estate planning team. And it tells it, it has all the clients and where they are in our practice management, like w- which stage they're in, and you know what the next step is, so that that way it, it keeps that line of communication open, and it, it it works like a dream. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean that's one of those, you know. So that that that's sort of an example of something that I've implemented that that, that that's been helpful. I, I mean, part of it is also has also been a been a mindset shift and you know some of that i i can thank you and i can thank uh your partner greg for sort of helping me sort of have that mindset shift you know well thank you and yeah. and you're welcome but mostly thank you <laughs> and, and and a lot of the you know working with with lawyers because i am in their coaching program and i have been for a year uh and you know i, re- I i'm also in the max law guild um and so that is helpful i've i've read traction i've read some of the other the other books um, in the traction series, and that sort of sort of helps understand, you know, why these things are necessary. And you know, one of the things that I've really sh- been trying to do and sort of struggling to do uh, is put together an, an accountability chart to sort of better understand what are all the different tasks uh, or things that we need to make sure are done, and that someone needs to be accountable for. Because, like that issue with the estate with the estate planning, like. It was no one's job. No one was accountable for moving those cases through the process, and and so uh, by default, that meant that it was my job, but I wasn't doing it either. And and I realized that the the, the worst person to be the case manager on anything is me. Like it, it has to be someone else because they're always going to do a better job than I'm going to do. Well, it's a it's a bandwidth yeah. issue. It's a and it's a. You can hire somebody to be a case manager a lot easier than you can find somebody who can do the what needs to be done by a lawyer work or what needs to be done by the business owner work on the stuff. Right, right. You know, and and I can and I can tell you, you know, from you know, from looking through through, you know, trying to do an accountability chart, like it sort of identifies, like I said, like I've I've identified like two other positions that event that I eventually want to have. And it's because I'm like I'm trying to apply those lessons from the estate planning practice area to like my probate practice area because it's it's ah. incre- it's incredibly busy, uh, which means that that my probate paralegal doesn't really have the bandwidth to 
hold a lot of hands and sort of, you know, move through the process. And I, and I, and I, and I, so I think that, you know, having someone whose job it is to sort of just keep the train on the tracks uh, would, would be immensely helpful uh, in that, in that, for that practice area. So it's just sort of, it, it it's, it's interesting because I, I'm trying to look, trying now to look at things more from like the 50,000 foot view and, you know, but also then get stuck in the weeds on the, you know, because I, I'm sort of in both roles where, where I'm, because I'm the only, the only attorney, you know, I can't delegate everything away, but I try to, I try to delegate enough of those, you know, administrative tasks to someone, someone else who has a better skill set for it. Totally. So I want to go into what you mentioned and kind of break those down a little bit more uh, specificity. So you talked about the case management, the case manager role. Did you, I, I, were you serious about it truly really keeping me up at night or was that sort of a throwaway line? Like, is that why that was the biggest thing for you to hire because it was so stressful on you? I mean, it definitely, it, it, you know, that's, that is the sort of stuff that keeps me up at night because that's the stuff that produces malpractice claims. You know, when you, when you don't follow through on stuff and when people think you're doing something and you're not doing something and, you know, and, and then it, that's also the stuff that, that brings down your reputation. And, and, and then, then you start having less people want to come to you to do the work because you get the reputation of, oh, well, he doesn't get anything done. And, and and I don't want to be in that position. Position. I mean, my, I have I have always wanted to be. You know, with clients, I always want to say, you know, you, you if you hire us to do a job, we're going to do the job. We're going to do it right. We're going to get it done. And and when when that when that when we don't follow through on that, that that gets that's what gets me the most upset. Makes total sense. No, and it's it's um, you know, John Strohmeyer always talks about kind of moving the needle for clients. They're hiring us to get them from here to here to move the needle. Yeah, and so I sense. love the concept that you've identified, not just not just like the specific task that moves the needle, but really what that says about your firm from a branding standpoint, that the faster you move that needle or the better you get that client's work done, the more it benefits you. And so I think that's just such a great use of resources that I think a lot of other law firm owners really need to sit down and think about like where where is the biggest ball being dropped in the easiest way to fix it in the way that also gets me the best brand awareness, the best, cl better client experience, the best reputation builder, you know, whatever you want to call it. I think that was awesome. Yeah. It's also, you know, on a very basic level, it's also a cash flow issue, you know, because at least in the way that we, that we, that, that our practice runs, we don't get paid on an estate plan until it's signed. So, uh. so we don't, we don't, we have never been, we have never taken, you know, that 50% deposit up front. We've always, you know, cause we've, I've never, I can think of one time in like the last 10 plus years when I've had a client stiff me, you know, it just doesn't happen uh, in with those sort of cases. So we've always sort of take, you know, so if the work doesn't get done, we don't get paid. So there's, there's also that motive. <laughs> Great incentive. But you know, when you're running a practice, because you don't think you're running a business, you know, you don't, you don't think about the dollars and cents, you just assume it's going to show up. Well, and then you go out of, and then, then you are go out of business, or at least you're not positioned to help as many people as you could be when you're not looking at the money flow, the cash flow. Right. And, and, and another thing that I think is, is important is, you know, if you're ever thinking about an exit strategy uh, from the, from the practice, you sort of having those processes and procedures is what's saleable, you know, and, and I think, you know, a lot of, you know, when you focus just on, well, this is my practice and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work it and then I'm going to retire. I mean, you, you know, as, as attorneys, you're sort of, you're sort of, you're leaving a lot on the table because you're not, you're not, you're not leveraging you know, your systems and processes and, you know, your secret sauce as, as a, as a value or as an asset, you know, law firms should be, should be assets, not liabilities. Totally. I mean, every company should be, we yeah. just find, we just find that excuse of, well, I'm a lawyer. Well, it's important. Well, it's, we're a profession, you know, whatever we try to talk ourselves into. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we talk ourselves into a lot as, as lawyers, we're very persuasive because that's what our jobs are. Um, and, but 
I think if if we're running, you know, if we're running a, you know, running a business and sort of looking back, you know, as from, you know, running, running things just as a, uh, as a practice versus running a business. I mean, I'm, I'm happier for it because, because I, I feel like, especially when, you know, things move through the process and, you know, all of a sudden, you know, there are, you know, their clients are happy money's coming in and I haven't had to, to, to do every piece of the process that that's always fantastic. Totally. So the next thing you mentioned, you talked about the mindset shift. So mm -hmm. walk me through a little bit of what you, how your mindset shifted, how you got your mindset to shift. Like, I think that's a huge thing. Um, cause obviously I'm a big fan of like, we are the creator of our own problems, but as terrible as that sounds, it's also liberating because we mm -hmm. can, it's easier to change ourselves than change other people. You are absolutely right. Uh, we can't change other people, um, but we can we can always change ourselves, and we can always change how we react to other people. Uh, I guess I think that that it's it really for me it started it started I want to say 2018 2019 was when I started to really start a mindset shift. So 2018, one of the things that that we that we decided to do was opening uh, the real estate title business. We we had done a lot of real estate work historically. We had had a relationship with another uh, title insurance company uh, that, you know, what was was helpful was helpful to us. But I started to look at this and, and, and realize I was sending a lot of this business, you know, out the door and uh, and at the, you know, somewhat foolishly thought, well, I can do this. It's it, it can't be that hard. Never say that to yourself because it, it 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 actually ended up being a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. But now we're in a we're in a really good spot, and I've you know trained an, an employee who can who can sort of sort of does about ninety percent of the work um, and better than than I would ever do it. Uh, so so that there we go. That, so that so so that, you know and and w it's more lucrative than than if we still had the relationship with this other title company, which, which ended, which was ending anyway, it had nothing to do with, with me, but it just, but it just, the relationship was ending. So it, it sort of, you know, but it, it's sort of ironic because I was sort of in, it, it sort of pushed me into a different industry. And I started seeing, you know, some of the software products that, that, that industry had. And it sort of started to make me think that there was a different way to do things. And, and so then I started paying attention a little bit more, you know, to things like like some Facebook groups that that I'm in, um, you know, where people, you know, other lawyers are talking about how they're how they're were running their businesses, and we actually, you know, that was when you know then we started looking at you know at getting into into modern practice management using at the, at that time using Clio and things like you know using using something like DocuSign to get a fee agreement signed. I mean, just these little, these little things. And I remember having these conversations with my office manager and just saying, you know, this is the way of the future, you know, and we, we need to start getting on board. Now, little did I know that, it, that within a year that it was going to become so critical um, and sort of push everything forward, you know, a lot faster. But it, I, I, I credit. I, I go, I go back and forth on like, if you're a firm that doesn't have e-signature now, after two years of COVID, Am I more impressed or more disappointed? And like, I don't know. It depends well, upon the day. Well, I, I will digress for a moment and tell you tell you a story. I, I had this conversation with my with my mother recently. She had to have a medical procedure done. It was nothing major. She's she's fine, and she was you know, and she's you know in her sixties, and she complain she's complaining to me because this doctor sent her all of this paperwork that she had to fill out. They, I think they emailed it to her or, or they told her that she had to print it from her website, their website, but the only way she could return it was by fax or by dropping it off at the office. And, and I said, and I said to her, we were talking about how ridiculous that, that is, that they made it available digitally, but they still, you, I mean, who has a fax machine? <laughs> I mean, uh, dude, at this point, I think, uh, I think my, phone company has like a you know you can take a picture of it and upload it through there but like yeah i don't know yeah i mean we have a fax number but it, it's e-fax i mean we don't even right. you know we made that switch at the beginning of covid and, because and i didn't even have a dedicated fax machine at that point anyway and the only things that 
I, I mean, I get very little that comes through there. Um, but it just it just sort of highlighted exactly what you're just saying, like like how this day and age, how are you not using, you know, Lawmatics or something like Lawmatics, um, which I started using. We we actually finished our onboarding like right at the beginning of 2020, um, which was good and bad because it it, it meant that it meant that like, like we literally had to throw out everything that Johnny prepared for us um, because <laughs> the way we did business completely shifted. <laughs> But everyone had that problem. Um, and, but you would have had to make that change at some point. You just accelerated the uh, right. the suck. Right, right. But it, but it, you know this this conversation with my mother just sort of highlighted like why it makes sense that you know we're sending out all of the you know these these forms to get information get information because it used to be that like you know I would schedule a consultation for estate planning for an hour. And half of it would be me. Okay, so what's your name and what's your address? And you know, I have I have a terminal degree in my in in my field, and this is this is what I'm doing. And and so by by implementing this, by you know these intake forms, and you know also putting in a process where you know my my receptionist actually fills out a form when he answers the phone, so that we collect this information and get it into Lawmatics. I've taken what used to take be, be 60 minutes and made it 30 minutes. Right. So now I can do, I can do two in one hour if I needed to, you know, it, so, you know, it, it just makes my time more, more efficient. I'm not sure if I answered your question at all. <laughs> no, I mean, it, look, it's a great conversation regardless of any of that stuff because ultimately like we're getting into the mindset of in this case, really the end user, your mom, confirming for you the business owner that you've made great business decisions which like is totally the case <laughs> right right it's just it's just funny you know that uh that that but it was just it was just a um it was an it was an interesting it was just an interesting conversation based on all the things i've been thinking about you know and trying to implement and sort of showing me that 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 i'm on i'm on that right path so from the mindset component i mean are you is it like you're looking into the future? Is it that you thought more about your client's journey? Like what was what was the mental aspect of this on your end that allowed you to make these decisions? So I do think about a lot about client journey. I think I am I am not good at putting myself in their shoes because you know, and that's that's something that I do struggle with. But I also, you know, I'm trying to, you know, under, trying to understand, trying to make our services more accessible and have them be what the client is looking for have it not be a, because a lot of law firms it, it it's law firm centric it's you need to do this because this is the way we've always done it and you have to do it you know do it our way and client consumers don't want that anymore they want to do it their way and some of that is you know we we send them send them a for, the form they we send it by text we send it by email you know, if they want it on paper, we can send it. I don't think anyone's ever asked for it on paper. Uh, if you want to talk to my intake person over the phone and he'll take down some information, you know, and we're trying to trying to meet people where they are, uh, you know, doing, you know, by doing meetings through Zoom or, or phone or whatnot, because it's just we, we, we want our practice to be client centered as opposed to firm centered. Well, and it's, I mean, look, nobody wants to give me money. Nobody wants to give you money. Nobody really no. wants to spend any money, but we love buying random stuff. So mm -hmm. the easier you make it, I think the easier it is for people to talk themselves into it or enjoy the process and therefore leave reviews, send other people, become a referral source, you know, whatever it's going to be along those lines. Right. You know, it, I might, my financial advisor, uh, who's a friend of mine, uh, had referred her daughter to me, and you know her daughter is probably, she's probably your age, Jordan, probably in her thirties, um, and you know has a couple of kids, and she, she she found it so helpful that she could schedule an appointment with me online, she could meet with me over Zoom, that we could do everything. You know, she never had to leave her house. She she said if I had to get dressed and, and, and go to someone's, go to his office, it never would have happened. You know, the only time she had to actually meet with someone 
was for 15 minutes to sign all the documents because we need ink signatures. Everything else was done, you know, at her convenience. And that's the client of the future. That's the client. That, those are the clients. Those are the people who are going to become all of our clients in the next five to 10 years. Because, you know, that's the generation that we should be, we should be looking at and trying, trying to cater our services to. So where LegalZoom is going to end up with their six millionth client before, you know, you, somebody else's law firm gets their 10th. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's all, you know, it's, and it's sort of similar to like, I didn't listen to your, your, your um, episode last week, but now I need to go back and, and do it because, and listen to it because I think that it's completely right. The, the, pra the practice is being digitalized and, and what I'm looking at is not what we're doing today or tomorrow, but how are we going to do this in five years? Because five years ago, I never would have thought that we were doing it the way that we're doing it now. Totally. <laughs> but so, be... I mean, that's what I wanted to talk about now. So like, what's, what's the future for you? What's the future of your firm? What are those other jobs, you know, you're waiting to hire somebody on? Uh, so the, 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 the future is more digitalization, um, more, more marketing, you know, digitally. Um, one of one of the one of the things that I'm that I'm looking to hire to hire on is um, is really a uh, a marketing assistant who can sort of sort of um, coordinate a lot of the stuff that that you guys are are going to be doing for us. You know, music to my ears. Thank you. Not, not, not to replace you, but to no, no, no. But 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 to to sort of facilitate some of it. Um, and so you know, Greg and I have had lots of conversations about you know needing someone um and and i had someone who who was going to be in that role but we have to we're doing a little bit of a staff shuffle so so now i'm looking i'm looking at you know you know that's something that i that i would that i would want um i've also looked at you know i've also looked at potentially you know pairing you know a marketing coordinator with you know with a sort of along the something along the lines of like a client happiness coordinator you know someone someone who can you know do for the our probate practice you know what i've done for the estate planning practice you know someone who can just sort of try to make sure that the clients are are know what's going on in their case are satisfied because those cases can can take about 18 months and there can be long periods of time where they hear nothing and i think that people assume that nothing means nothing's being done right and, and then they don't see the value and, and, and I think that we that we need to do a better job about showing the value and then making sure that everything stays on track uh, and asking my my paralegal to do that plus do all the legal work is a lot. Uh, yeah, I was talking to uh, Billy Tarasio last week. Um, and so she was talking about they've got their client advocates, so the, the intake people, but then they also do the client check ins. And they also circle back with the clients afterwards about reviews and, and you know, mm -hmm. seeing how everything's going. And it was so interesting because she talked about from that timeline, they're telling the client what to expect. They're making sure the client has, has gotten the expectation that they met. And then they're getting feedback and, and reviews at the end and whatnot. Um, and so it's so strong, especially to loop, you know, a little bit of that into marketing or have that person report to your marketing department about like, literally, these are what clients love about us. This is what I'm doing in sales. Tell them about it. This is what we can present in our marketing to get more people to have that same experience, and it just creates a, a whirlpool of success. Right, and and, that, and that's that's a big part of what I'm, of what I'm of what I'm looking at looking at doing. I'm sorry if you can hear my four year old losing his mind in the other room. No, listen, I got a I got a three year old in the other room losing his mind here, so it might be it might be her, it might be my end. Nobody knows, but this is life in uh, 2021, almost 2022. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, I I think that going forward like I, like I, I want to continue to leverage technology to reach clients you know I used to think small I used to think that I could only service clients that were within say a 30 mile radius of my office I don't see that as the future I, I at this point I, I don't see why I couldn't write estate plans for people anywhere in in the state that I'm in Pennsylvania where I'm where I'm where I'm practicing I I don't you know in and we do have a we we have a process and a system for, you know, how to do how to train clients to do their own signings if we need to, and you know, you know what, you know how we would support them to do that. Uh, I I would like 
at some point the the ability to have clients be able to go on our website and you know prepare very simple documents uh you know these are all you know some of this stuff is you know it, it's it's not really trade secrets there there are other attorneys who who have done some of this some of the same sort of stuff so you know uh and and i i just i i really just feel like there's just so many different opportunities totally so as we get towards the end we talk i mean we covered a lot of stuff you know your journey the future what you're looking at now i mean this has been an awesome episode i think anything else you want to make sure we cover any big things that we missed we will have the final takeaway at the end but i just want to make sure we tap into your brain for as many nuggets of wisdom as, as are uh, going to come out i'm glad to hear you think that there are nuggets of wisdom to come out <laughs> But <laughs> Dude, we're all we're all in we are all running the same race. Yeah, we all have very similar struggles and hearing what people have overcome and hearing what people are still struggling with and hearing about the mindset that people have to get through it. I mean, that's what we need as lawyers. Yeah. We are we can truly be here for each other by sharing our stories with a lot more honesty and compassion. Yeah. And and I think that, you know, takeaway is 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 really listen to what other people are doing and what other people and what and what but try to stay away from from the the fomo or the fear of missing out because i think that and, and i'm and i'm guilty of this because because i sort of jump you know it's like you jump from thing to thing to thing but i think the most important thing is just be intentional and set out set out on your path and and do it you know you know one, one step at a time like it doesn't you're not gonna it's not gonna all happen in one in one day but you know you can get there be intentional, set out on your path and do it. I love how you broke that down because like really that <laughs> it is amazing to me how many people that we know that have amazing ideas, but without that doing your part, without that execution, they're constantly in the same place. Yeah, I was, I was, <laughs> I was texting with Russ Nesevich uh, earlier this afternoon about how, how I suck at implementation. <laughs> You know, because we're working on a project together and we we're trying to, and we just were like, we're just going to do this and get it done. So Russ, Russ squared. So nice. We, uh, we named it, it twice. Is, yeah. It's like Russ squared. <laughs> Dude. I mean, that's, you talked about traction, man. Like that's why, uh, is it, is it rocket fuel? The one that talks about the, in, the visionary with the integrator. Yeah. Like to me, that was the most helpful book in the series just because it was like, no, I get it up here. It's getting it trickled down to there. Mm -hmm. Like that's the problem. So I'm with right. you, man. Right. Awesome. All right. So I want to talk about our next episode. Um, our next episode is going to be way different. Our next episode will be our last episode of the year. That's going to air next Thursday at 1.30. So that would be the 23rd at 1.30 Eastern time. So that would put it at, oh gosh, I don't even know. What time is it? And East Coast, it's 2.45. So we started this at 2. So that'll yes. put it a half an hour earlier than you watch this episode. Does that sound right? Are we 2.45 in East? It's 2.45 in the East right now. Okay. So we started this at 2. So a half an hour earlier than you watch this episode next Thursday, we have our year-end recap episode. And we have not done 100 episodes. We've got pretty close. And so what we're going to identify is the consistencies between the episodes. The advice that we've heard over and over again the things that have really been the most important from our guests compiled together, as well as some cool things we learned along the way in terms of putting the show on. So if you go back and you watch the very first episode of this show to now, you'll see some pretty cool changes on our end. And we're going to talk about some of that process next Thursday, 1.30 for our year end recap episode. And then we'll take two weeks off. We're going on hiatus. Uh, we'll be back the beginning of January after that. So I hope that you have got a ton of value out of these exhibit A shows. I know we've enjoyed doing them a ton. Um, so yeah, that'll be great. But Russ, if you want to repeat what you just said, I'm totally cool with that. But if you want, if you were talking to as many attorneys as possible, whether they're watching this or listening to it on the podcast, the biggest piece of advice for them, the most important takeaway for them to be the exhibit A of a successful attorney like yourself would it be the make the plan on, you know, try the plan, honor the plan, do the plan, whatever it was you just talked about, or is there it, something else? It, it would, it would be, you know, be, be intentional, you know, do it. There was something in the middle there. It was. <laughs> I do. It was third. 
we'll, we'll, yeah. it's okay. We'll we'll fix this in post. Greg yeah. will go back and cut it. No, but, like the uh, the be intentional, make a plan, do the plan. I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. Be be intentional, make the plan, do the plan. But I think also don't be afraid to iterate because okay. it's you know sometimes you, you you decide to do something and it ends up not being the right thing, uh, and it's okay to change it. It's okay to change your mind, but but make sure that you you're there's a, there's a good reason for it. Totally. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And that's why I like a lot of, you know, when we're talking about marketing plans with clients, we're talking about like setting the right timeline of expectation because you don't want the shiny object syndrome going back and forth and mm -hmm. this and that and, you know, always changing ship. But at the same time, I've talked to other people like, hey, I've been doing these ads for three years and never made money. And I'm like, what do you mean? Like, how, how, how did you just keep throwing more money after bad money already? So. Yeah, you, you have to you have to just be be careful that you you always want to be evaluating, and I think that's why some of the lessons of traction just make make a lot of sense because because in traction, you're you're really only looking at things you know ninety days at a time, and but that gives you the ability to say okay we've been doing this this thing for ninety days and it is and it isn't working, you know do we do it do we do it for another ninety days but it like it sort of forces you to sort of constantly reassess those things. Totally, love it. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. For uh, everybody you. listening, like I said, we've got that year-end recap episode coming next Thursday at 1.30. Um, if you jump into our Solutions for Lawyers free Facebook group, if you've got any questions that you want us answered on the year-end recap, you can go ahead and do that now. You have about a week to go pop that stuff up there. And seriously, man, I appreciate your time so much. That was a wonderful journey that I love that you shared it with us. Oh, thank you for having me. It was, it was fun.